I'm Piers Thompson and I am one of the rebel residents of the Silchester estate. We are talking the day after Edward Daffarn gave his um, evidence to the inquiry. He of course, as you know, for standing up and putting his head above the parapet, for highlighting the, in this case, the fire safety issues that were um, becoming more and more apparent at Grenfell as the refurbishment carried on. He was branded a troublemaker. I, I noticed actually during the inquiry yesterday on one of the pieces of paper, it noted that the TMO and RBKC were seriously concerned that unrest would spread to Silchester. In around 2015, just after, or as they were finishing the cladding on Grenfell Tower, the council, RBKC, came to the residents of Silchester with a plan to regenerate the whole estate. They drew a red line around a map of our estate, called it the Red Line Regeneration. And essentially, although they said they were consulting us, their plan was to knock down the entire estate, to build twice as many dwellings, smaller, obviously, uh, of which we would be having access to maybe a third. And about two thirds, maybe half of our residents would have had the right to come back and live here. People like me who own my own home would have been offered a chance to spend the same money on buying half of my home on a shared equity basis. The Silchester estate was built around the same time as Lancaster West by a different organisation. The GLC built one, Kensington Chelsea built the other one. Together we formed the area that is now called Latimer. We're separated by the railway line. It's, you know, it's, it's run down. No one's spent any money on this area for 30 years, but we love it. We have Waynefleet Square, which is a gorgeous place for, you know, young people to sit around and talk rubbish. It's a great place to take your kids, walk your dog. We have um, another fabulous space behind there by Markland, between Markland and Frinstead House. We have a community, some of whom have been here since the day the estate was opened in whatever it was, 71 or something. We have other people who've moved here recently, some of them from war-torn territories. Some like me chose to move here as it was one of the last areas that, that represented the old community spirit that Notting Hill first attracted people to Notting Hill in the first place. For the purpose of somehow ensuring that these people of the future were going to have somewhere to buy an empty property to stash their illegal cash. Uh, you were going to knock all of that down. Because you can see right now the soulless buildings that they were going to replace us with. If you look over the top of Wayne Fleet Square to White City and Shepherd's Bush towards the Westfield, there are these monstrous towers rising above our community. There's now, um, an understanding, I think, in agriculture, that ploughing, which we've done for thousands of years, is not such a good idea. It destroys the mycelium, it, draw, it destroys the hidden underground networks that hold the eco-culture together. And when you knock down a building, you're knocking down all those root systems that connect people, because you've scattered them, and then they come back and what build a new life, how's that better than their old life? We acted very quickly, and if anyone's listening who is involved in housing action, the most important thing is to act quickly and with unity. We realised, partly because we were being advised by our friends around the neighbourhood in Westway 23 at the Grenfell Action Group, that we should consider the council's plans as almost a fait accompli, almost a done deal. So we very quickly um, framed a narrative that the council were coming down to demolish our homes, to enclose our green spaces and to scatter our community. We then embarked upon a, a period of consultation. That consultation is framed in very nice fluffy words, but the crucial part of it is the con rather than the saltation. Now that is with the benefit of hindsight, but the consultation process, we felt very managed. 
first off, on the very first consultation, they dropped the notification of it 24 hours before the first meeting. So obviously hardly anyone turned up. We were more organized by the second meeting. They came down, um, they presented it as a shiny new flat for people who'd been living on an estate which had been in a uh, system of managed decline for at least 10, if not more years. They told people on insecure tenancies, temporary arrangements, that they would be getting a shiny new flat, which was barefaced lying. There were six options. Uh, each option had a number of boxes next to it. And the only box, the only option that had all the boxes ticked is the one that knocked down the entire estate. We did want to ensure that if they were going to do this outrageous thing to us, at least everyone was going to know about it. Everyone was going to understand what the consequences were and everyone was going to have their voice heard as to what they wanted. We reached out to other dissenters in the neighborhood to support us either by coming and helping us um, with petitions, with leaflets, with advice. Uh, we even, in fact, went to one of the axes of evil, the Westway Trust, because the council had made a mistake in their plans in that they included part of the Westway Trust land without uh, talking to the Westway Trust, who at the time were very property driven, very development driven. Every now and then, Rock Fielding Mellon, the architect of this grand design, would pop in and grace us with his patronage. Um, he was on the whole condescending. He presented the idea as progress, that anyone standing in the way was some kind of NIMBY, someone who cared more about preserving a broken present than looking towards a fantastic shiny future. I mean, in fact, at one point, Rock Philly Mellon, he came round here to meet with Tanya, my wife and myself. He came here on the condition that Ed Daffarm would not be here. That was his one condition for coming. We gave him a cup of coffee, he sat in our kitchen table and told us that uh, unfortunately we were collateral damage in his grand projet. So the council, the council basically treated us, they treated us with disdain, I would say, more than anything else. We were definitely treated differently from the way the Grenfell Action Group and specifically Ed were treated. I think there are, there are one or two reasons for that. One thing we had coalesced around the RA, which had got 36 years of interaction with the council. We were gold standard RA. I don't know what that means, but we were, or we are, I hope we still are. Um, so they were, I think they were dealing with a slightly larger group of people. And it has to be said, probably a more obviously middle class group of people than um, than Ed and his colleagues at, at CAG. Uh, there was, we also did present a certain unity from the chairman of the RA down to the people who uh, heard about it, you know, third, fourth hand from talk around the estate. This area has had no money put into it, certainly for 20 years, probably for longer. Um, through FOI requests, uh, Grenfell Action Group found out that in the five years before the fire, the council and TMO had taken 17 or 18 million pounds in service and rent, and they'd spent something like a million and a half on the estate in that time. We had very similar figures when we got the FOI request for our profit and loss on the Silchester estate. Uh, we've heard stories that the, the Tories, Tory MPs, Tory grandees, were embarrassed when their pals drove back into London on the M40, the A40 on the Westway. The first bit of London you see is these four towers, used to be five towers. 
it, you know, people use the word social cleansing a lot. I think in this case, it really does amount to an attempt to socially cleanse this area. They saw Imperial College on the other side of the railway line growing a huge campus. There was this little dream that Freston Road would become some biotech hub, like we're in Silicon Valley suddenly. So they, they saw opportunity here. When Rockfilly Mellon came around here and told me we were collateral damage for his grand projects, he said the problem was that most people want to live in the nice houses down, you know, Powys Way, Colville Way. And, you know, he was trying to re <laughs> reintroduce the Victorian street pattern, which seems to be some kind of weird obsession they have. Uh, Kim Taylor Smith, when we talked to him on the consultation about the Silchester Arches proposal, told us that now everybody wants to come and live in North Kensington because they want to come here for the sense of community. So, I don't know. It seems a lot by the, like the same shit, different day. We felt we were never taken seriously by the council. We felt that they saw the consultation process as an irritation. The third parties that they had involved in this, which is an architect called Porphyrius and CBRE, who are the huge uh, property company, second biggest in the world, based in Hong Kong and LA. The officers, the officers of um, these third party companies treated us again as though we were an irritation, very much uh, reminded of Ed Daffan's comment about the Ryden op operative, who said they, that the residents of Grenfell shouldn't be grumbling because they were getting it for free. I mean, that was, that was very much the sense we got. At that very first consultation that Rockfield and Mellon deigned to turn up at, he was pursued around the room by a number of people, um, mainly just regular members of the community who wanted to know how this huge plan was going to impact their lives. He told us in no uncertain terms, I said to him, what happens if 1,700 residents write you a letter saying we do not want this to happen? He said it was a decision that was going to be taken at the town hall and at the town hall alone. And I think, you know, we felt that we were being treated with such contempt that uh, that's what generated the idea of the Silchester chicken. You know, if they're going to treat us like headless chickens, well, we'll dress like headless chickens. So I would dress up as a chicken whenever we went down to the town hall or when we um, went on these little uh, expeditions down the road to protest outside Rockfilling Mellon's house. This land is your land. Quick cry of North Kensington, not social Kensington. Yes. <laughs> One, two, three. North Kensington, not social Kensington. We used our theme song, um, actually the Dap King's version of This Land Is Our Land, the Woody Guthrie song, this or This Land, land Is Your Land, land. depending on which way you want yeah. to sing it. Um, this land is our land. It's where our houses are. It may technically, the ground rent may be paid to RBKC, but this is, our RBKC are simply there to represent us, to steward our you know, to, to protect us, to look after us, to empty our bins. Um, this idea developed that somehow the land here didn't belong to the people who lived on it. It belonged to the council. And one of the council's political ideas were, um, we, we essentially won our fight on April Fool's Day 2017 because we'd created an alliance that had blocked significant parts of the regeneration plan. So on April 1st, 2017, they took out the Westway Trust land. 
They took out Akavar, which is the arts uh, studios uh, just behind us now. And also, bizarrely, they took out half of the terrace that I live in. So there was myself, my neighbor, there's a TV personality who lives next door to my neighbor. And they were gonna cut down the side of his house and, um, and, and build, you know, up between there and the railway. At this point, we realized that they couldn't bring down the towers because as long as the decant policy remained in place, which I know is a big if, but as long as the decant policy re remained in place, they could no longer knock down a tower and have enough room to house the people coming out of the tower so that they could build in the next place. Um, I, to me, that was abusive. The reason it was abusive is that they thought that by coming to me and essentially buying me off, by telling them they weren't gonna knock down my house, that somehow we were going to go along with the rest of it. So you can be sure that at the consultation the following day, I was there in the chicken soup. The Silchester regeneration plan was stumbling around already by the time the fire happened. What the fire did was to knock it out of the ballpark. You know, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's obviously terrible that it took something like that to kill the plan off. Um, again, there's something about their unholy haste to drop the plan once they'd been caught with their pants down that was semi-abusive, uh, I thought, in many ways. My instinct is if the, if, if the fire hadn't happened, what we'd be doing here is we, some of these buildings would still be here, possibly Bramley House, possibly my house. I think you wouldn't be able to hear me right now because there'd be drilling works going on behind me. Um, I think you'd have found that Waynefleet Square was being built over, even as we speak. Uh, that was one of their infill plans to build some monstrous blue building on Waynefleet Square. We've got Grenfell Tower behind us. It's obviously covered in uh, the white tarp at the moment. I think we are probably safe as long as the tower is there and it looks like it's going to be there for a while longer. They all, there's a wood yard up, up the road that tree wise men use. We ourselves suggested that might be somewhere you could build social housing. So the council went away and came back with a plan for a nine storey tower opposite Grenfell, you know, on a tiny plot of land. So, you know, the faces have changed. The talk's a bit more fluffy. I, I, I don't think their complete lack of understanding of the way ordinary people live in this kind of rather beautiful, you know, every now and then we're a bit grumpy, this beautiful harmony that we have in Latimer, we have in Grove, we have in the whole of North Kensington. I don't think they, they understand that. The, since the fire finally killed the plans for Silchester Estate, they've had to address the managed decline of the last 30 years. Now the, Four towers of Silchester are in an unbelievable state of disrepair. Bits have fallen off Markland, bits have fallen off Dixon. Um, it's, it's now taken nearly four years and they're about to put the plans out for tender, which means they will finally start, if we're lucky, next March, March 2022. I mean, that shows a disregard We've got a situation where bits are falling off the tower blocks and it has taken three and a half years to get to the point of putting out a tender. To me, that shows disregard for our community. Furthermore, as an RA, we still engage on a regular basis with the council and they're about to spend, I think it's 30 million pounds on the towers here. 30 million pounds of construction work. Who's gonna do that work? We have begged them to consider 
using this project as a means to train up some of our young people into jobs which you know, you'll always need plasterers, you'll always need chippies, you'll always need electricians, you'll always need banksmen. Why are they they're making no effort to hire a cohort of young people from here to do this work? We, we had a, an RBKC um, RA meeting the other day on Zoom. Um, Doug Goldring was there overseeing. And one of the most shocking items on the agenda to me is that, if anything, the repair service is running at a worse rate than it was just after the fire. Um, you know, this is, th these are bits of paper that we get on a regular basis. And it beggars belief after Doug Goldring came in and promised he was going to be a boring council executive, like we used to have back in the day, uh, that they haven't in four years been able to sort out something simple like the people carrying out the repairs being courteous to the residents whose homes they're in. One of the things I was most impressed by with Ed yesterday is in spite of his simmering rage, which has been simmering since about 2011, all his dealings with the council were courteous, polite, to the point, no ranting. And I think we will endeavour to maintain that level of good humour in our dealings with the council. But if anyone is, is watching or listening right now, you know, we are keeping our eyes on you. I mean, there are a lot of people around here who have been described as rebel res residents, as troublemakers. And I, you know, if I'm in that group, I'm really proud to be in that group. So we took the tabernacle back for the community. We kicked down the fences in Powys Square. Um, just before the fire, as probably a lot of you will know, there was a whole confluence of um, nascent uh, dissenting outfits here, whether it was Westway 23 objecting to the Westfield, Westfield occasion of the Portobello Road, whether it was us demanding that uh, our homes were not demolished for no particular reason, whether it was trying to stop the library becoming an independent prep school. Um, though we have always, in the, you know, we've led We've led this country, we've led the world in some ways in standing up for the rights of ordinary people. And I am very proud if anyone has ever considered me to be part of that group.